here. April Spate is a developer, author, speaker, and educator who believes that creating for XR should be accessible for all. At Microsoft, she leads the strategic bets focus areas, gaming, green, rust, and spatial computing within cloud advocacy. Her experience in technical training and developing curriculum spans 10 years in the nonprofit sector and now includes the onboarding of developing for HR. Her focus on fundamentals, safety, design principles, and inclusivity serves as the foundation of her approach for educating others. She believes that learning shouldn't start with building an app or an experience, rather understanding what, why, and the impact that is, stepping, that is a stepping stone to fostering a new generation of developers who are both mindful and strategic throughout the creation process. Her passion lies in the use and development of AR and VR apps and experiences for educational purposes. Her most notable achievement is her team's success at the January 2020 MIT Reality Hack. Together, they won Best in Learning, Education, and Research, as well as Best in Health and Wellness plus Medical for their app, Spellbound, a VR learning experience designed to help children with dyslexia and dysgraphia learn letter formation and word recognition. Thank you, April. Welcome. Thank you. So again, make sure you can hear me. Hello, everyone. My name is April, and welcome to the XR Summit at Michigan. As mentioned, I'm Strategic Bet Leads within Cloud Advocacy at Microsoft. And what exactly is a cloud advocate? Well, we're a group of super passionate developers and non-developers who advocate on behalf of and to our respective technical communities. So for me, that entails our Rust team, which is programming language, green for green software development, as well as gaming and spatial computing. And spatial computing is what actually brought me here with you all today. Now, before I get more into who I am and speaking on the topic of this keynote, I wanted to let you all know that I brought some friends along with me for the ride. In fact, there's one here on this slide. That's little minifigure me. I designed her. I even made her outfit as well. I like using minifigures because they help me a lot with regards to explaining concepts, and especially because I can customize them as well. So for this presentation, I created a collection of minifigures that will help me illustrate topics that I plan to cover. Also, it's because I'm obsessed with Lego bricks, and I just like doing a lot with Legos. So on to my background. So how did I get here? Well, I flew in from Los Angeles, California. But with respect to my experience in the XR industry, it's actually more interesting. Ironically, it actually also started with a flight. I was in LaGuardia, summer 2019. We were having a Microsoft event going on, and I was just tuning in on Twitter, scrolling to see what was going on. And I had saw a HoloLens demo. Now, I've seen the HoloLens before. However, what really amazed me was that the presenter was speaking with another person, a co-presenter, and during that presentation, the co-presenter was speaking in Japanese, but everything that they were saying was being translated in real time to English, and it displayed in front of the presenter as well. That's what blew my mind away. I had a stint in linguistics when I was an undergrad, so when it comes to anything with regards to language, I'm obsessed with it, and I love it. So like most millennials, after seeing that, I went to Twitter, and I asked everyone, how do I get started doing that exactly? And that's when the XR community responses started flooding in. Folks from Magic Leap reached out, who I'm still very much good friends with today. Our Mixed Reality team also reached out to me as well, and they provided some resources, as well as the general XR community also reached out and shared resources as well. So it was definitely somewhat of a learning curve for me. I have a Python background, and so I had to learn C Sharp, and then also had to learn Unity as well. So that was definitely eye-opening. But I can say that taking that journey has definitely changed a lot and with regards to my own career trajectory because that's what brings me here with you all today, seeing a really cool demo. So fast forward six months after that, I found myself both on a new team at Microsoft within cloud advocacy, specifically the spatial computing team. And then I also found myself at my very first hackathon, which was, as Jeremy mentioned, the MIT Reality Hack. So the MIT Reality Hack is an annual XR hackathon that takes place in MIT, typically in, I would say, January, but it's fluctuated a bit since COVID. Prior to attending this hackathon, this was my very first hackathon I had ever attended. 
Prior to that, I just did YouTube videos. I taught different programming concepts. I'm a self-taught developer, so I didn't go to school for this. I actually went to school for global business and public policy, and then for grad school, I did luxury and fashion management at SCAD. So I didn't have an actual educational background in this field. But going into this hackathon, I was a little bit nervous, didn't know what to expect, but it was definitely well worth it. When I actually arrived to this hackathon, we were told that we weren't supposed to arrive with teams already formed. We had to meet people there and then form our teams, which I think was super helpful because when you're brand new to these sort of environments, things can come off a little clicky if everybody knows each other, and then it's hard to find folks to work with. But fortunately, I actually met these guys that are here at the table with me. And during this event, I met Mike, Taylor, Logan, as well as Kai. Never met before a day in our lives. We hadn't even spoken on social media at all. But during team formation, we had actually bonded over the fact that we all wanted to create an educational app. It was just kind of fate that we all wanted to do that. So one thing about me is that I love school. I've always loved school, never stopped loving school, and I'm obsessed with school teaching as well as educators. And so being able to find this team of guys who were actually all very interested in that was just probably the best thing that could happen. So as Jeremy mentioned in my bio, we did create a VR learning game to help children with dyslexia and dysgraphia learn letter formation and word recognition. And we named the app Spellbound. Now what we did was what most new indie XR developers tend to do when they're creating. We just dove right in. We didn't have much time to go and review a lot of XR fundamentals. And of the five of us here at this table, Mike, the guy on the left to my left, he was the only one that actually had deep experience in this space. He had been doing VR development for 20 years, but the rest of us were brand new. Um, for the hackathon, just for context, there were a lot of people who were new to just XR development in general, which is why I think it's a really great hackathon. Not to plug it, but it's a really good hackathon to attend. So for me, I had only spent, as I mentioned, six months prior just learning whenever I had a chance how to do anything XR. And then for, uh, for Kai and Logan um, as well, and Taylor, there was some on and off uh, work with it as well. So Mike was the only one that really had experience. And because of this, we kind of didn't quite know what we were getting ourselves into with this great idea that we had. And we only had two days as well. So it wasn't as though we had a month to actually dedicate towards learning how to do all of this programming as well. And it was a hackathon. And we almost pulled an all-nighter, but the MIT Reality Hack has a really good policy where there is no um, overnighters. So you can work for a very long time, but you have to go back to your hotel eventually and go to sleep and then wake back up the next day, which is healthy when it comes to hackathons. Now, because we were creating an app for children, that meant we had to think like a child. And I'm unsure if you can tell by the photo, but none of us are children. So we definitely had to do a lot of research with regards to whatever we had at, um, at, at, at hand to actually learn more. Fortunately, Taylor's fiance was a speech, uh, children's speech therapist. So that was perfect. A lot of phone calls with her all the way back on the West Coast to just learn more about what's it like working with children, especially as we're putting together this app. And then in addition to that, also consulting with Mike and Logan for their opinion on whether their, how their child would respond to something within the app because they had children. And so in addition to that, we also had to do some speed research on should children even use VR as well because we knew that would probably also come up during judging, which it did, which we also had a response, which was great that we did that research in advance as well. So at one point in the app, we had to add a scene transition from the opening beginning screen to the actual gameplay. And initially, we opted for a black screen tra transition. However, one of the guys pointed out that we couldn't do that. And I asked why. And the response was, well, because some children are afraid of the dark. And for me, someone who does not have children and who is definitely in their 30s, it didn't occur to me that, oh yeah, children probably don't want to be in the dark. We already given them a headset to put on. So now they're immersed, and now you want to transition them from something that's bright and colorful to nothing. That can be scary, probably also traumatizing for a child. So when we had that conversation, to me, it was like a light bulb went off. And I went, oh yeah, duh, we can't put a child in the dark. 
So what we ended up doing was opting for um, a white transition. It was a very quick transition, but regardless of how quick the transition was, we just couldn't do something that was completely dark. So that was one thing that was eye-opening for me. The next topic that we noodled on was what color to make the user's hands. So for context, in this app, there is this wizard and the wizard is helping you with forming the letters that appear in front of you. So right now we have the word bat on the screen. The user then takes their wand and they learn how to write whatever the word that we give you. The words continue to get smaller and smaller and smaller. So it's helping with their letter formation. And then at the very end, when they uh, are done with spelling the word, they have to say it. And then once they say it, they cast a spell. So that's conceptually what it's like. In the midst of that though, we were trying to figure out, well, what color hand should the user have? We couldn't do white because we didn't want to give the wrong message to students who may not have lighter color skin, and we couldn't go the opposite direction and go darker because likewise. So what we ended up doing um, in the end was rather than displaying the hands itself, we focused more on having this wand, which is uh, on the top right half of this screen. Because for us, it was a good, happy medium had we had more than two days, we probably would have dug a bit more into that. But we also didn't want to provide a, an option that wasn't going to be best for the experience of the student. Because for me, if I was a child and I looked down and my hands weren't brown and they were a color that didn't reflect my skin tone, it would just be a little odd for me. So altogether, I would say this was a good decision for the time that we had. So putting this level of attention into designing and creating our app paid off. In the end, we ended up winning across two categories. One was learning education and research. The second was health and wellness in medical. I look very tired in this photo because one day in I lost my voice and also I was beyond tired, but I was excited because we won in two categories, which was like pretty huge. We didn't think we were going to win. We went into this creating from a place of passion. And we were just super excited to have this happen. Um, with regards to where the app is today, uh, Mike on the far right, the one that I said that had the most years of experience in um, XR, he continued working on the project in grad school program that, um, that he's in. And so the rest of us gave our blessing. We said, yeah, sure, go ahead, continue to work through it. If you wanna take a look at the app itself, it is available on DevPost if you search for Spellbound. We also have a GitHub repository as well that's included with it. And I just remember when one of the judges came by and he was trying it out and he was like, you did this in two days? And we're like, yeah, we did it in two days. And he was just amazed at the amount of work that we did. But a lot of that comes from the people that you're working with as well. And um, I was looking at old footage the, uh, the other night from the event itself uh, because we thought we were making a documentary. We thought we were cool. And so we just took random footage throughout the process and Taylor, the tall guy, uh, he had mentioned just advice for doing these sort of hackathons and he essentially said that make sure you're working with a good group of people, not a-holes, because that can really make or break a team when you're doing these sort of projects, especially when you're a group of people who come together who don't know one another. So it was really great. But what I learned from creating Spellbound is that when your developer team is not reflective of the end user, and when proper research is not conducted, there's a lot that can be missed and that can provide a poor experience for the end user. More important, when you're creating immersive experiences to facilitate learning, it is imperative that we do our best to develop these experiences to be both diverse and inclusive. So outside of loving to use money figures to illustrate concepts, I also like to level set by defining terms. So throughout this presentation, I'm going to be defining some terms for you to make sure we're all on the same page when I say something. And in addition to that, uh, I have some examples to go with it as well. So to begin, first we're gonna start with diverse. And we're also going to define inclusive. The reason being is that these two words have turned into very big buzzwords as of late. And a lot of people tend to use them a little willy-nilly uh, willy here and there, as well as some related concepts. So I just wanted to find these to make sure we're all on the same page. So to be diverse, simple enough, means to differ from one another. And so as we have here on the slide, I have too many figures. They are different, they are not the same. So I think that definition was pretty easy. The next one is inclusive. So to be inclusive means to include everyone. 
And I really like the tail end of the definition that Merriam-Webster provides, which is to allow and accommodate people who have historically been excluded because of their race, their gender, their sexuality, or their ability. So here we have a group of many figures, and not only are they diverse because they are all different. However, this grouping is inclusive of religious beliefs, their gender, their race, abilities, and their age as well. And this is also why I like using many figures for this keynote because they're pretty inclusive with regards to the design that's available. And as a 3D modeler, I can also create pieces too if I need it. But they worked out perfect. Lego had a pretty good collection. So regarding creating for XR, why do we struggle to actually create apps and experiences that are diverse and inclusive? We have the technical know-how, we have the bright ideas, and they're great ideas, trust me. And we want to bring something innovative to the masses. We want to do something that folks have never seen before. We want to innovate on ways to learn as well. And then there's also all these awesome devices that you can use for these experiences. So we want to have people try and use these devices too. However, if you aren't necessarily in considering the end user or if they're not fully represented, then none of that matters. It becomes a very poor experience. And at the end of the day, it's, it's almost as though you wasted time creating the experience. So you really want to make sure that you fully represent the user. So let's tap into some factors to, uh, to consider that can lead to creating apps that lack diversity and inclusion. So the first one is unconscious bias. So unconscious bias is unconscious favoritism towards or prejudice against people of a particular ethnicity, gender, or social group that influences one actions or perceptions. It's not an intentional action. That's what makes it unconscious. And so therefore, it can be influenced by your own lived experiences. So for example, suppose you've never seen a day in your life a woman construction worker don't know one, don't even know that they exist. You may then think that women are not construction workers. In fact, they are. If you take a look through TikTok, YouTube, HGTV, there are a lot of women who do construction these days. And so therefore, your unconscious bias may not believe what is here on the screen, which is a woman construction worker who's also a minifigure. Now, with respect to creating and fostering learning spaces, be mindful that biases are unintentionally integrated into our experiences. So just the other day, a friend of mine, she had sent me this video that this guy had posted on TikTok where he was demoing a VR plane safety simulation. And he was, it was funny. He made some commentary that was funny. But as I'm looking around the plane, it's supposed to represent an actual airline that someone's on. And as he makes his way to the front of the plane, which is first class, everyone there was white. There was no one of color in first class. And so it's like, mm, everyone rides first class. However, you have to consider that whoever maybe created the app, that may not have been intentional to do that. But if we don't think in that manner in terms of like, hey, let's include others, it can also give the wrong message as well. Next is the lack of representation. So this can be reflective in either design or engineering teams as well as avatar systems as well. So when the end user isn't represented across the designer um, engineering teams, the outcome isn't necessarily always bad. Uh, for example, Spellbound, none of us were children as a perfect example, but the app itself was deemed good, I would say. So it's not always a bad team when our teams aren't fully represented, however, What's important to do to overcome that is to do exhaustive research. User research is super helpful. Ensure that you're able to get your app in front of the people who are actually using the app as well. And if you can advocate for more diverse teams and hopefully have additional folks who can join who can better represent the user base or provide different opinions, that's also super helpful as well. So when our teams lack diversity, it can become easy to forget about the end users and uh, for ones who don't look, act, or think like us, and rightfully so. If we haven't lived other experiences, it's, it's hard to put ourselves in someone else's shoes, so I completely get that. So as I mentioned, to overcome this, advocate for more diversity and research, research, research. Now for me, one area that's really usually telling of whether a design or end developer team lacks diversity is in the avatar system. 
So for avatars, I feel here most of us know what avatars are, but just in case if not, they're virtual representations of a person in the real world. So here on the screen, I have real life me, and then on the right would be my avatar. She has pink cool hair. So avatars, they aren't necessarily always humanoid. They come in various forms. There's robots, uh, there's fantasy characters, there's also inanimate objects. I'm not sure if anyone here has seen the documentary we met in VR, but in one part of the video, one of the people, I forgot what household object someone chose for their avatar, but it just goes to show that an avatar doesn't have to look like a human. It could really be anything. But with respect to what I'm going to touch upon is for those moments when we do want to use humanoid avatars to reflect who we are. So avatar design systems, they vary by app. And because of that, that's also why I'm going to focus on the humanoid ones. So exemplified by today's audience, we all look different. We're not the same. And I actually love that because if we all look the same, I think it'd be a pretty boring world that we lived in. So I love that we're all different. But because we're all unique, we also want to ensure that as we're designing avatar systems, we're reflecting that as well. I will say it's almost impossible to consider every single characteristic under the sun when you're creating these systems, so I totally get that. But there are some common trends that I've seen over the years when it comes to creating these systems that I really hope that we continue to help overcome. Now, I have seen some good avatar systems as well that exist out here, and we're continuing to make improvements. But as I shared, unfortunately, I have come across some that haven't hit the mark. And so it's just something to think about. First one is going to be the representation of skin tones. That's a big one. So the first skin tone on the far left, this is typically what you're going to see across all avatar systems. It's a really big bucket to encompass various different people. Even if you look at our uh, emojis, uh, when the ones on these on iPhone where you can choose a color, you usually want to see a much more lighter skin tone, light, more lighter, fairer skin tone. And that's cool. Now the middle skin tone is typically where things tend to stop when it comes to providing darker skin tones. And it's not quite fair because there are people of various different ethnicities who are actually darker than that. But when your system stops there, it's almost like erasure. You're just forgetting everyone else who fits in this other bucket. So what do we then end up having to do? We end up having to settle for a skin tone that doesn't reflect us. So last year, my best friend, who honestly, we look exactly alike. I don't know how, we have different parents, but we look exactly alike. She just has way shorter hair than me. She was creating a world for a pride event, and she was super excited to share with me. I didn't have a moment to step into VR, so she sent me some screenshots. And in those screenshots was her avatar, and she pointed it out, and I said, girl, why is your avatar so light? And she was like, well, this was all they had. And I said, oh, hmm, okay. And that's not fair. It's, it's, it can definitely be painful, I would say, to want to use these systems and you're not reflected in them. So it's always nicer to provide more darker options. And as here with my minifigure heads, um, I think that color I use is dark brown. They have a lot of different shades for minifigures, believe it or not. But in any case, what I, want to, what I want to leave you with here with this point is that if you are creating avatar systems, do strive to provide various skin tone options. It's like makeup foundation as well, and that's another rabbit hole I'm not even gonna get into. But just make sure that we are representing everyone. And even when you are bringing this technology into the classroom, and let's say that whatever program you're using has avatars, make sure that your students are also represented as well because it sucks to be that one kid whose avatar really doesn't look like them because the system that the teacher chose just didn't reflect them as well. But also don't get me wrong, when it comes to avatars, not everyone wants an avatar that looks like them. There's multiple reasons, various reasons why folks create avatars who don't look like them, which I think is beautiful when it comes to avatars. But for those instances where we are in those settings where we do need avatars who more or less look like us, this is where these sort of topics I feel are definitely more prevalent and more important. So my usual challenge also, which is another telltale sign when it comes to reflecting whether a design or engineering team was not diverse, is hair. Now today, my hair is straight and it's curly. However, my hair 
it's changed a lot over time. But when it comes to having hair that reflects more of my blackness and who I am, that has always been a challenge. Being able to have thick textured hair, cornrows, braids, afros, bantu knots, afro puffs, locks, you seldom find these in avatar systems. And if you aren't familiar with what a lot of those hairstyles are, but you are a designer who's responsible for creating these, I would definitely say do your research because this is one of the things I can say a lot of my peers who look like me, as soon as we have an avatar system, we go through all the hairstyles, see what's available. And when, and when we don't see anything that's there that suits us, it's just like, oh, I guess I'll go with the straight long hair again, which we all don't have straight long hair either. And nothing's wrong with straight long hair, I've had that too. But it's whenever we are looking for hair that more represents who we are, it also seems more like erasure as well. So in the grand scheme of things, uh, things why does this level of detail matter? Well, something pretty interesting happens when we use an avatar. We experience embodiment. So embodiment is a sensation that our self is located inside a virtual body. And we control this body. This body also belongs to us. And our real life appearance doesn't have to reflect our virtual avatar to experience embodiment. It's almost like method acting in a sense. So suppose this pirate avatar was my avatar. I like pirates. And embodiment uh, with this, that means that I will mentally and physically act as though I'm a pirate uh, with a hook hand and an eye patch and a peg leg as well. And I may even talk like a pirate as well because this is who I virtually am. However, how is this actually possible? We did a 2018 avatar study at Microsoft, um, our research team did, and it concluded that embodiment is complex as it includes not only body ownership over the avatar, but also agency, co-location, and external appearance. Despite the multiple variables that influence it, the illusion is quite robust. And it can be produced even if the self-avatar is of a different age, size, gender, or race from the participant's own body. So there's also a very interesting study presented at the CHI Conference on Human Factors and Computing Systems back in 2021 on the effects of using VR um, or avatars for VR exercising. So the study consisted of 24 participants. They pedaled on stationary bikes while wearing a VR headset. And they did this pedaling in 20 minute intervals. The participants were evenly split by gender and they were, this was a study that was in Germany, so for them gender for the study was male or female, but as we know, gender is definitely a spectrum. But for this study, that's how they worded it, they split it between two genders. They were college students and working professionals who did not cycle regularly. So these weren't your CrossFit, or not your CrossFit, they weren't the uh, Peloton folks, these were folks who just didn't really cycle. And the experiment they did, they cycled three times and they did so one um, as each of the three avatars that were available. So here are some images of what actually everything looked like. So the headsets themselves, they showed a participant in a virtual room, a fitness room. They were facing a mirror so they could see the avatar in front of them as they were cycling. And during the study, participants also wore heart rate monitors. And they rated how much effort they were exerting about every five minutes throughout the workout while the bikes recorded their pedaling frequency. After each workout, participants, they filled out a study and they uh, or survey answering questions such as how fit they thought their avatar looked and how fast they thought their avatar was going. And there were other questions as well. They also assess how closely they identify with the avatar relating to one or two statements. The first being that I felt that the virtual body I saw when looking at myself in the mirror was my body. The other being I felt as if I had two bodies. The study concluded that participants with muscular avatars felt they had exerted the least effort and had significantly lower heart rates. And those with, with the non-muscular avatars, they exerted the most effort and had higher heart rates. So I thought that was fascinating. I don't know if you think it's fascinating, but I thought it was fascinating. And so what it goes to show is that a person's outward or their virtual outward appearance had a really large effect on their performance. And so the authors of the study, they connect their findings, what is known to as the Proteus effect. 
So the Proteus effect is a psychological phenomenon in which people who use an avatar, they adopt the behavior and attitudes associated with the avatar's characteristics, such as their height or their conventional attractiveness. I have Batman here because that's who came to mind. So if you take Bruce Wayne, for example, he's very quiet, he's cowardly, very timid. I'm not a big fan of Bruce Wayne, by the way. But when he's Batman, completely different guy. He's crime fighting, he's confident, he's still quiet, but he's completely different. It's something about putting that mask on and that, uh, I don't want to call it a costume, but I'll call it a costume. He's a whole different person. He takes on this whole newfound confidence. Well, that same thing can happen to us with regards to when we take on this persona of an avatar as well. And so this is why it matters that we're providing options for avatar designs that are fully representative of who our end user is. So just keep that in mind because what we don't want to do is cause any potential um, psychological damage as well if we're limiting people to who they can look like if they choose to like themselves in VR. The next challenge is accessibility. This is a very big topic. There's a lot of research that exists on this topic as well. And for accessibility, I'll define it first, but it refers to something that is easily used or accessed by people with disabilities. And it's adapted for use by people with disabilities. XR is for everybody. And uh, with that said, when we're creating experiences, we want to ensure that we're including everyone regardless of their abilities as well. There's a lot of different um, uh, toolkits that are available and ways to integrate uh, features that are going to be more accessible for folks as well. I know we have one that slips my mind right now from Microsoft that we created a couple years ago. But when it comes to accessibility, we want to make sure that we are including uh, everyone as well. So I mentioned there's a, lot of, there's a lot of different areas here. I'm going to just focus on audio and mobility, but do know that there are various other factors at play as well. So when it comes to audio, before I get into the accessibility side, just to set it up with regards to what sort of audio we can include in experiences, there's four different types of uh, audio clues, cues. The first being ambient. So that's going to be the background noise you hear. So imagine you are in a city, you hear cars honking, people walking by, music playing, that's background noise, that's going to be your ambient sound. Then there's object. So that's going to be sound that's produced from an object itself. So suppose you're in a room and there's a radiator in the background. You can hear it humming. That's going to be the object sound because that's sound that's being produced by that. Then there's movement. So movement's going to be the sound of the result of movement. So if there is a foot walking across the pavement, that tapping that happens every time, or if you're running, that when, you're, when the foot's hitting the pavement, that's going to be movement. And then the final one is informational. So that's going to be any sort of, of, um, of audio that provides instructions. So if you have something that says, press this button, that would be an instructional or informational cue. Now, when it comes to adding in these sort of sounds in your experiences, especially when it comes to VR experiences, they're great because it can really help create a very nice immersive feel to whatever you're doing. And I like adding various forms of these in apps that I create. However, they're not always leveraged with accessibility in mind. So when you are adding audio to your apps, your experiences, there's some things I'd like for you to consider as well. The first is going to be integrating features to turn off ambient soundscapes. So that ambient noise, as I mentioned, it adds a nice immersive layer to an experience, but it can also be distracting with someone, um, for someone with a hearing disability. So if you have a way to turn that off, whether it's a button of some sort, it's a really good idea to include that. You can also provide visual or haptic equivalents in place of audio. So haptics, it's going to refer to any technology that can create an experience of touch by applying forces, vibrations, motions to the user. So when you get a text message, your phone vibrates, that's a haptic as an example. When it comes to uh, providing the ability to control the location, a spatialized audio is also going to be pretty helpful as well. So spatialized audio provides that digital surround sound that you'll get um, in an experience. And actually, I hadn't um, realized till more recently that this can also be a negative for some folks um, as well. Uh, if anyone happens to listen to LeVar Burton Reads, his podcast, he introduced uh, spatialized 
audio version of like all his stories that he, well not all of them, but some of the stories that he reads. And in one of his recent episodes, he had mentioned that they added the ability to turn that off because some people were actually complaining that they couldn't hear the characters fully when they had the spatialized audio on. And as I'm just listening, I'm like, oh, I didn't even think about that. And he had followed up by saying that if you turn it off, you'll be able to probably hear the characters better. But again, not a lived experience for me, so it's not something that I considered, but it goes to show you why it's important to make sure that we are thinking of others and then we're doing our research and including others when we're creating experiences. Also, that's a very great podcast, by the way. And then finally, the, uh, consider providing the ability to turn on captions. So that one's a huge one. Uh, we have captions on TV, YouTube videos, Instagram has captions, TikTok has captions. VR experience should also have captions, even if it's an AR experience. So the ability to turn that on or off is great. More important, if you're adding in captions, also consider what languages are available to because not everyone speaks whatever your native language may be. So if you have more of a global uh, user base, think about what other languages to incorporate as well. Then we have mobility. So with regards to mobility, engaging in XR experiences can be a challenge with, uh, for those with, mobility with a mobility disability. So more often when developers create these experiences, they create with the quote unquote norm that a user will be able to move around in an invertible environment. And it's not just limited to walking, that's also being able to hold and move controllers, being able to turn their head around with uh, headsets as well. So in general, being able to move their head, their arms, their legs. But as we all know, we do not live in a fully mobile world. And so people with a mobile disability should also be able to take part in XR as well. So we want to make sure that they're able to do that regardless of using um, things such as like their feet or their hands as well. So some challenges that people with mobility and uh, disabilities face are using input devices. And so that's going to be your controller. So if you need someone to be able to press buttons or swing things around, that's going to be your input, your input devices. Head tracking, as I mentioned, if you're wearing a headset and the user needs to move their heads around to view things, if they don't have the ability to do that, it's a challenge for them, it interrupts the experience for them as well. And then locomotion, that's moving around an environment. If you uh, have an app that only has one mode and that's room scale mode and they're not able to actually do something in a seated mode, that can be a challenge too because they also can't take part so it's important and helpful to make sure that we are doing what we, what we can to make these devices more accessible for those with mobility disabilities as well. Therefore, what I want you to consider first with regards to features is to integrate providing the ability to adjust time limits. So if your app requires a response in X amount of limits, See if you can also add a feature to allow the adjustment of time. Maybe it's a setting that's in the beginning before someone enters an experience or during the experience as well. Because it may take someone just a bit longer to be able to press a button that needs to be pressed for whatever the next step in, um, in an app is. And then speaking of input, there's also enabling multiple input sources as well. And so being able to have someone use more than just your standard controller that comes with the headset. So if you're using a MetaQuest, for example, rather than saying you have to use the MetaQuest handset, uh, maybe, there's, maybe there's more of an adaptive controller that's available that's helpful that the user can use. So being able to provide that is also uh, pretty great as well. And then also providing a focus indicator as well. So that focus indicator, what it's going to help with is, especially if someone's not able to fully move their head around, it would be the ability um, to just focus on something. And then it's like a, it's like a, a focus and commit where it's like a two-step process where they focus first and then from there they can commit by doing another action. And maybe that might be speaking, maybe that I would say speaking is probably a good one. There's some other options too, but being able to provide a focus indicator will be helpful with just focusing on certain things. I can say when it comes to having mobility disabilities, um, for me personally, 2020, I had surgery on not one, but both feet. 
So I was completely immobile and I was not able to um, move around freely at all. So I took the entire month off of work because this is the space I was working in. I knew it was going to be far too difficult to do really anything in VR that required me moving around. And in addition to that, I didn't want to have to worry about just trying to find as much accommodation I needed. So I didn't work for that month. And fortunately, I was able to do that. But what it did shine a light on was the fact that it can be very disheartening to want to take part in things XR related, but knowing that you can't because you can't actually physically move around if not everyone's app is going to be inclusive. And for me, it wasn't permanent, but for a lot of folks, the, um, their mobility disabilities are permanent. So we want to make sure that we're considering them as well. My feet are fine today, by the way. If you may have noticed, I was walking around, but it was quite the recovery, I would say. The final thing that I'll cover is one that I set out to make a difference in in the last year, and that's the digital divide. So the digital divide refers to the difference in access and to knowledge of the use of new technologies. So when I started my role in cloud advocacy, I did a lot of talks around the XR community, and I joined various online meetups as well, and I even led some workshops, and I do, I do some of that still today as well. But one thing that I noticed, however, is that many of the rooms I entered, not many people looked like me. And so I wanted to do something about that. So what I did was I started an initiative to bring XR workshops to historically black colleges and universities. Myself, along with three other internal colleagues, as well as one of our external partners, Engaged Media. And we chose to target HBCUs outside of the commonly known ones because the way we saw it, those schools were often left out when a lot of large tech companies set out to do these HBCU initi initiatives. There's just about 100 HBCUs total, but most folks probably know about 10 or so. So we really wanted to target that other 90 group that unfortunately often gets left out. So we went on this journey, um, and I would say it was probably one of the most fulfilling things that uh, I personally have ever done, um, ever, I would say, since I've been working here at Microsoft. We brought HoloLens to these students. We brought Babylon JS workshops as well. And for, I would say, most if not all these students, they had never used these devices. They also had provided the feedback of, no one else has come and done this for us either. And to me, it was, yes, happy to know that we were making a difference, but it was also sad to know that no one was actually taking the time, especially the larger companies, to come to these schools and these communities and bring this technology. And so here on uh, the left image, this was us at the HBCU Legacy Bowl workshop. We had about 100 football players join in for this event from various HBCUs. And this is me with some of the football players from that event. And we did a Babylon JS workshop there. We did some HoloLens demos. and just being stopped throughout the hotel from, by different football players just saying how thankful they were that we came and did this workshop for them. That really, it really made me super happy. Um, almost at tier level, not a crier, but almost at tier level. And then the one on the right is from uh, Grambling State University. This, at this point, we decided to migrate to, or transition to a hybrid model to in order us to actually target more than one school at a time. So we tried this out with them, and you can't quite tell, but in the far back on the screen is me at home. So I delivered this workshop from California. We had students from Grambling State, which is the ones that are here, and then we also um, had students from Southern um, as well. They weren't in the picture for obvious reasons because they were physically at their school at Southern. But we also had some people available on site to help with the students as well. So if there were questions, there were actual representatives from Microsoft as well as our partner Engage Media to help out with the students. And so when it comes to the digital divide, it can really separate the haves from the haves nots. And because of this, it can lead um, leaving out an entire group of, poten of um, untapped potential. There's a lot of potential creators that we came across during uh, doing this initiative. And it really does take just the exposure to just show someone and to spend time with them, here's how you do X, Y, Z. And for me, one thing that I felt personal about, as well as the others I partnered with, was 
we didn't want to see our own community left behind with all the innovation that was happening in XR. So that's why we dedicated a lot of this time here, our own resources, and in some cases our own money to do this because we wanted to have it done. And we said, regardless of whether we worked at Microsoft or not, this is what we wanted to do, and we made it happen. It was definitely a journey. <laughs> I can definitely say that. But we pulled it together, and I'm very glad we did. So those are the areas that I wanted to cover with respect to D&I, and for especially if you're someone that's creating, if you're a developer as well. If you're on the other end of the spectrum and you're not a creator, but rather you want to bring XR into the classroom, I believe we have some folks talking about that a bit later. But there are two key pieces of information I do want to leave you with just to keep in mind. And it comes from conversations that I've had with other educators who have either thought about bringing XR into the classroom or they already did it, but it's not going how they thought it was going. And so with that said, the first thing is to make sure that you're providing adequate training for the professors, the instructors, the teachers that will be required to use the technology in the classroom. And so, as I mentioned, I've come across that excited professor or department head that they want to roll it out everywhere. They want everyone to use it because it's great. And that's cool. However, when the people who are actually the ones using it in the classroom, such as the teachers, if they don't know how to use the technology, well, that's a blocker right there and then you really get nowhere. So what I would suggest doing is providing how-to guides, provide the proper training that's necessary, provide resources that these professors and teachers and instructors can go back and reference as they're using it in the classroom as well. Now, for most of us in this room, we're probably familiar with regards to how to use the hardware and how to use the different apps. How, um, but for, that's not the case for everyone because once you turn that device on, for some folks, they don't know what's next at all. And so we have to make sure that we keep that in, t in mind as we are um, embarking on rolling this out across, uh, let's say, a classroom setting. The next thing also is to ensure you have uh, the proper internal resources to support a rollout. So this goes beyond just your professors and your instructors and your teachers. It's also your IT team. Do they know what to do once they receive this box of devices? They have to get it onto the network. They have to also lock it down to make sure that things aren't um, improperly exposed onto there or things aren't leaking out or things of that nature. And if they don't know uh, how to do device enrollment for the devices, that's another blocker as well. And so I know we have the HoloLens and we've done some work as well to provide guidance on how to do that. And I'm sure when it comes to MetaQuest, there's also guidance as well. But that's all to say, make sure that your IT teams aren't forgotten about as well. They need to know what to do once they have the device. Plus also not to mention, are they the ones that provide the troubleshooting support if the device stops working? And if so, do they know how to do that? We have to make sure that everyone's well equipped if you're doing a technology rollout. So if you're interested in checking out some immersive educational experiences in general, I did mention Spellbound, our hackathon project. And as I mentioned, you can find that on DevPost if you um, search for Spellbound. The GitHub repository is there as well. We also have a trailer video, too, that we put together. The voice of the wizard in it is Kai. We had some fun recording that. Um, and then next we have Kai XR, completely different Kai from the Kai I just mentioned, but the Kai XR is actually a friend of mine, Kai is her name, and she created a platform for providing 360 degree virtual field trips. So she and her team, they travel the world, they set up a 360 degree camera, and they record. And sometimes they provide interviews as well. And these field trips are used in school settings. Students are able to try them out. They can learn more. I believe on YouTube, you're able to preview the one that's available for the Obama's portrait um, exhibit. There was one video, I can't remember how I came across it, but there was one based in, um, in France, for example, and they visit different sites there. So that's another platform to uh, take a look into. And then the final one, I know they're actually here today, Case Western Reserve, there's Hollow Anatomy as well. And so uh, with Hollow Anatomy, it's a software suite, gives students 3D perspectives of every part of the human body. I haven't personally tried this one out. However, two guys on my team, they were able to do a demo with them and they were just blown away. As soon as the call ended, they ran back to me and were just like, oh my goodness, this is amazing. So 
for what I do know, the demo is available in the Windows Store if you um, have access to a HoloLens to try that out. And there's many, many more educational experiences available. I feel like Jeremy just mentioned like 100 of them earlier. But these are the sort of experiences I personally love to use um, and leverage. And to just bring things full circle, that very first demo that I saw that Microsoft did for the speech translation, I've now been working in this space since, formerly, I guess, since 20, 20 now, I probably recreated maybe like three or four versions of that app to this day because that's how much I really loved it. And that's just using various different Azure products and services that we have. But all that's to say, use, utilizing XR for educational purposes is just something I'll always love to do. And uh, I just want to make sure as others out there are either creating their own experiences or bringing experiences into the classroom that we do think about DNI as well. So I covered a lot today. And with respect to DNI, the one thing I want to leave you with is that we're all still learning. No one has it perfect. No one's expecting you to be perfect. But I think what's most important is that we're making an effort to be as diverse and inclusive as we can and that we are including others in our apps. The apps that I've made, is there room for improvement? Absolutely. There's so many different things that we could do to improve. Even with Spellbound, there was ways that we could have improved it to make it more, um, more inclusive as well. But I share that to say that as long as we're doing our best to make sure we're doing our part to be inclusive, we can continue to create a world of, um, of apps and experiences that's accessible for everyone because XR is for everybody. Okay, thank you for your time. I appreciate it. If you do want to connect. <laughs>